Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you very much for joining us over the Zoom platform. And um, I will also apologize for any technical difficulties on my end. So um, what I would like to do is um, looking forward to sharing my knowledge with you today in the area that I work in here at Families Matter. So let's just get things going. And then as well, um, there will be time at the end if there are any questions um, in the chat box that we can go over and hopefully we can get all those questions answered for you. So first of all, I would just like to take a moment to introduce myself and talk about the organization Families Matter that I work for. So there is a picture from um, when the first lockdown occurred in March, kind of April, and um, that is one of those portraits that was very popular at the time. So that is my little family unit, um, my husband, Jory, my daughter, Veronica, who is 13 and my son Tobias who is 17 and that hairy beast there between me and Tobias is our dog Sam and I am working from home and he is in the room with me he's sleeping now but no um, guarantee that you might not hear him barking at some point during the presentation so I apologize for that right from the get-go um, so I've worked for Families Matter for eight years I started um, volunteering actually and then moved to intake and phone support and then moved into their in-home support program where we would go in to the homes to support the families who needed it. Um, I've also facilitated a postpartum support group and I co-facilitate a PPD info night with my husband um, and it is um, geared toward partners whose um, family member is struggling with um, postpartum depression. I also currently supervise um, eight peer volunteers who provide supports over the phone to moms living outside of the Calgary city limits who have identified that need support, as well as four team members here at Families Matter who provide the supports here in Calgary. Um, one thing I want to say really quickly is I often get asked, what am I? In the sense of, am I a nurse? Am I a counselor? Am I a therapist? Am I a social worker? my psychologist and to that I answer I am none of those. Um, I am what would be defined as a peer supporter and what a peer supporter is is somebody who has lived experience with perinatal mood disorder and um, I came to Families Matter because of my lived experience to support other families and I was trained at Families Matter um, specifically to provide that support in the peer way um, and this program has been provided in Calgary for over 20 years and it was designed by a woman named Honey Watts and the information that I am presenting today is based on the work that I do at Families Matter and what we see there and the resources that we provide for the families who come to Families Matter. So Families Matter, if people are not familiar with it, they are a nonprofit organization that has been providing supports in, to Calgarians for over 15 years. Um, and so before it was Families Matter, it was three separate nonprofits that came together to create Families Matter. And that's why the perinatal mood um, supports has gone on longer um, with, because they were a part of another organization. Currently we are a family resource um, network um, with the new funding change that occurred last year. Um, at the end of this presentation, I will go into more detail about what Families Matter provides and the contact information as well, if anybody is interested, and as well if there's any of the questions about what Families Matter does. So what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about the title where it has PPD in the title as well as perinatal mood disorder. And why I want to talk a little bit about that is because PPD, postpartum depression, that term, that language can be very misleading in the sense that it is often not just depression that we see with the families that we're working with. And this can often lead to underreporting because a woman will say, well, I don't feel depressed, so I must not have postpartum depression. 
Um, and the people who are supporting the moms will often only look for those depressive symptoms, which can be not bonding with the baby or something that's called a blunt affect, which just means that her emotional responses are extremely low and not um, that connecting with the baby piece or crying all the time or can't get out of bed is the kind of the only things that are being looked for. And it only is usually considered for moms and not for dads. And so what perinatal mental health or perinatal mood disorder can refer to is it can refer to both the pregnancy and the postpartum period. And it can include what you see up there was this PPD, PPA, which is that anxiety, PPOCD, which is those perfectionistic uh, tendencies, panic attacks, sleep exhaustion, anger, scary thoughts, and more. And it can also speak to the fact that it can, can happen in both men and women. And so we have been moving more towards using the terminology of perinatal mental health or perinatal mood disorder to try to encompass all of these things. That being said, I will let you know that during my presentation, I will go back and forth using those words as it is something that is um, been around for a long time and just naturally is what um, I refer to. But the understanding being that we are trying to expand that knowledge and that language. So just a couple of recent statistics for Canada. Um, this was completed by the Statistics Canada survey, and it analyzed the experience of 7,085 respondents who gave birth in 2018. And the women were surveyed online and or by phone between the um, five to 13 months after the delivery. So what you can see here is the overall average for reported consistent with either postpartum depression or anxiety disorder was 23%. And these feelings that were self-reported are were reported as being more intense and longer lasting than the baby blues. And they may not resolve on their own. And later on in the next um, slide, I will be talking about that difference between baby blues and um, PPD or PPA. Um, and just some further little observations that I found interesting is just kind of where Alberta sits in all of this. And so Alberta is at 22% and we can see that's just kind of right around the um, average. Saskatchewan had the lowest percent at 16 and Nova Scotia had the highest percent at 31%. And it's kind of interesting if you see those pink that the Eastern provinces um, for overall um, had a higher rate of self-report. And this is, I would have to say, about standard. I would have to say that around that 23% is what a lot of studies show. Um, there is a feeling within the field that is greatly underreported and that many more families um, do struggle with some form of um, perinatal mood disorder in that postpartum period. And um, I feel that as we go on in the presentation, you'll probably start to understand why. But again, if you have any questions around that, um, please feel free to put those in. So this is the rage of the perinatal mood disorder. And as you can see, it's a lot. And this can be very overwhelming. And so what I would like to do now is to kind of go through each category and break it down. And again, really look at what we are seeing at Families Matter with the families that we support to get a better understanding for yourself or for somebody that you may be concerned about who may be struggling with this now or who may struggle with it in the future. And um, a part of talking about what the range is, is allows that language and that vocabulary for people to communicate to each other when they're asking for supports. So baby blues. And the reason I want to talk about baby blues before I talk about um, postpartum depression and or anxiety is because we often get the question of how do I know it's not just baby blues. And as you can see here, baby blues usually occur in um, the third to 15th day after the birth of the baby. And there's crying, irritability, tension, anger, restlessness, and it can range from mild to severe. And so I'd like to just give you a little example of a baby blues, and that is with my um, sister with the birth of her second. He was quite the crier, 
and we were out in Toronto supporting her. And um, she also had a toddler as well. And my husband offered to make my sister bannock for lunch. And my sister kind of said, well, why would you do that? And my husband said, well, because it's the one thing I kind of know how to make and I want to make you something so you can eat something while the babies are resting. And she got teary eyed and she started crying. So that is the sweetest thing anybody has ever said to me. And so it's that type of emotional response where just the sweetest things can cause you to cry. The littlest things can cause you to cry. Um, and it does dissipate after that time. And it does, you get back a little bit more to your normal. And this is something that can be very interesting. We had this conversation a lot with the mums who refer themselves. And sometimes what we will do is we will, um, in the intake process, if the mums, you know, as we we'll call, as I like to say, in the thick of it, of that, you know, day three to 15 after baby is born, is just to kind of give her some time and check back in on her in a week to see if the symptoms have become more severe, if they haven't dissipated. Um, that being said as well, that postpartum anxiety and depression piece can rear its ugly head in this time as well. And it is that self-reporting piece that is very important. If the mom is saying that this is not my usual, um, then that is something then that then goes further into that discussion about that postpartum depression and or anxiety um, piece. On the one side, uh, the tool that I have here um, is everything is awful and I'm not okay, questions to ask before giving up. And this is an awesome tool that I love to give to families and to ask them to put up on their fridge. Because what it can do is it can just give you some basics for coping in that time. The very first question it asks is, are you hydrated? If not, have a glass of water. Um, have you eaten in the past three hours? Have you um, stretched your legs in the past day? Have you said something nice to someone? And it kind of takes it through those basic steps, but it also just adds a little other component to it. This is my favorite question on the form, which is, do you feel unattractive? And then it says, and the response in this form is, uh, take a goddamn selfie and post it on Facebook and have everybody tell you how amazing you look for after just giving birth. And so again, it's just, giving those new moms and the families that are supporting them a simple way that they can help support them. And it is something that um, we really like to hand out to the two new moms um, as showing them a way that they can take care of themselves. And before I forget, I have baby pinks up there and that's something that's not as familiar as baby blues. And baby pinks is just the other end of the spectrum where you, um, feel that you just have energy that you've never had before you feel you see the world in a way that you've never seen it before and again happens in that same time period and um dissipates after some time as well and it does speak to just that um real huge hormone change that happens after giving birth to a baby and how that could impact you So the next piece is that exhaustion piece. And this is one of my favorite little cartoons to um, demonstrate exactly what it's like to be a new parent. And I just would like to speak to the fact that this is a very vulnerable time in a woman's life after giving birth, because she has physically gone through one of the toughest experiences in her life. And that's if there were no complications during the birth. And often women come to us knowing that they need help, but not knowing why they are feeling this way. And many people don't know that the physical symptoms up here of headaches, pit in the stomach, no appetite, neck and shoulder pain can actually be a symptom of that anxiety and or depression. And that exhaustion piece can often present itself as that depressive piece where it might actually just truly be exhaustion. Um, and that simplest decision that needs to be made can't be made in that place of exhaustion. One thing that we're able to do at Families Matter is we are connected with the women's mental health um, out of Foothills Hospital. And they are a group of psychiatrists 
who deal specifically with women who are struggling in the perinatal um, with perinatal mood disorder. And something about that sleep piece and how important sleep is, and this is something that we talk about constantly with our families, um, is the power of sleep. And the example that I would like to give is I was working with a mom and she was on the fence about that place of wanting to take medication, like an anti-anxiety or antidepressive, what they call an SSRI. And um, she was referred to women's mental health, saw a psychiatrist there. After the assessment period with the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist said that yes, the mom could choose to take a low dose SSRI, or she could focus on getting five hours of uninterrupted sleep a night. And it didn't have to be, it could be at any point, early in the night, in the middle of the night, in the morning, if you know the um, partner was able to wake up with the baby. But at some point, if she was able to get five hours straight of uninterrupted sleep, that that is the equivalent of taking a low dose SSRI. And working with the women that I do, um, and talking with them on a weekly basis, such a difference they would report um, around that, what their day was like based on the sleep that they got the night before and what a difference it made if they were able to get that uninterrupted sleep. So again, talking with the families about how to support a mom so she's able to get that sleep and support her partner so he's able to get that sleep as well. This adjustment period within um, the postpartum period is very complicated, as is demonstrated by this graphic provided by the Pacific Postpartum Support Society. With the families that I work with, I often talk about how becoming a parent is a paradigm, a paradigm shift. Whether it's becoming a new parent, a parent with a second or your third, everything changes in your life. And going forward, it takes time to adjust to all those changes. And this idea that you will never not be a parent now for the rest of your life can be pretty overwhelming for some people and it takes some time to adjust. Um, and so I really like this visual that's provided by this organization because it talks to all of the areas that can impact a person's life. And usually when I hand this out to families, I scratch out women and I just put person in the middle because again, same can be the impact for um, a, a dad. And it goes into the general losses and it goes into anthropological and personality and everything. And so again, just knowing that it's okay for a woman to talk about all of these areas of her life and how it's impacting her and that it is part of the post prime experience and it does take a while to get to. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about sleep exhaustion, because this is something different from the previous um, slide that's just pure exhaustion. Sleep exhaustion is referred to when somebody wants to desperately go to sleep, but they can't. And the reason that they can't go to sleep is because they can't turn off their mind. And one of the questions we asked during the intake process is when given the opportunity, are you able to sleep? And a lot of the times the answer is no, because I just can't turn my mind off. And it creates this vicious cycle of, I can't sleep because my anxiety is increased. So that increases my anxiety because I'm not sleeping. And yet I can't sleep because my anxiety is increased. And what happens is this is when um, we will often talk with the moms about talking with their family doctor or if they already have a psychiatrist or a therapist involved where um, medication may need to be introduced just to disrupt that cycle so they are able to start getting some of that sleep. And it is something that you know a lot of the women that we work with do struggle with is that inability to go to sleep because they can't just turn off their mind. Um, another thing that I would like to talk about is um, around this anxiety versus panic attack in the sense of that we were seeing this a lot again at Families Matter where people were talking about having an anxiety attack, which um, is a little bit mis misrepresentative in the sense that anxiety and panic attacks are two very different things. And we do spend a lot of time talking about 
this and it is something that we um, want to again create that language and that vocabulary for the families that we're working with so then they are able to ask for what they need or if they are seeking out professional supports to be able to talk to their doctor psychologist psychiatrist about exactly it is what they are struggling with so they can get the supports that they need and it's really interesting too because of that language around postpartum depression so many of the moms that i support when i start talking to them about anxiety they're like, oh, that actually is a little bit more accurate with what I'm struggling with. And so to take out of a look at difference between the anxiety versus panic attack is that anxiety is a gradual buildup of distressing emotions and symptoms can last from a few minutes to a few days or even weeks and can be experienced in three different levels. And this is where that miscommunication, because it can be mild, moderate, or severe. And a lot of times severe anxiety can be misinterpreted as a panic attack. And there's more of that cognitive um, impact, such as difficulty concentrating, and you're controlling your worries. Other things that are present in uh, increased anxiety can be a restlessness, a feeling wound up or on edge, being easily frightened, difficulty concentrating or having your mind go blank, irritability, muscle tension, difficulty controlling worries, and again, those sleep problems that we've been talking about. On the other side are the panic attacks. And panic attacks are sudden and intense fear. And symptoms typically decrease after 10 to 15 minutes. And this consistent experience of severe physical distress, what they're saying is if, um, there have been reports um, from the women that we've worked with who have had panic attacks of getting sick to their stomach, sweating, um, and um, or pit in the stomach even. And this is something that is consistent throughout. So if they have a panic attack, that tightness in the chest, difficulty breathing is consistent every time they have a panic attack. And some other of the physical symptoms of a panic attack, so that pounding heart or accelerated heart rate, excessive sweating, um, trembling or shaking, sensations of shortness of breath or a smothering feeling, feelings of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or um, abdominal distress, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded or faint, chills or heat sensations, numbness or tingling sensations, and that's often usually in the extremities in your fingers, feeling of unreality or being detached from oneself, fear of losing control or going crazy, or fear of dying. And so those are very specific to that uh, panic attack. And again, it is something that can happen in with perinatal mood disorder is that increased anxiety or those panic attacks. And just having mom have that knowledge or her support system around her having that knowledge of what it is that um, she may be struggling with. So this one is very interesting in the sense that the obsessive compulsive, um, what falls under that ca category are scary thoughts, which I'll go a little bit more into. Um, scary thoughts are these repetitive, persistent thoughts, ideas, behaviors, thoughts that come out of the blue, disturbing or alarming thoughts, thoughts of self-harm or harm to others, and feelings of not being able to control those thoughts coming. And I feel that this um, cartoon here on the left is a perfect example of that scary thought around dropping the baby. Um, and this is something we see again a lot at Families Matter. And just so you know, I'm going to be spending a little bit of time on this, nearly not enough time. I do um, a presentation often to um, them with nurses and um, other organizations where I can do a good two to three hour presentations just on scary thoughts. And so um, I will try to get as much as I can into this without overwhelming as well. Um, this is something that we see a lot of families matter. And it's honestly something that's not talked about enough. And it happens to both moms and dads. Um, many people are familiar with the idea of that obsessive compulsive um, and intrusive thinking related to OCD. This is, a more specific categorization, and it has been termed scary thoughts. And this information is based on um, a book by Karen, um, 
Karen Kleiman and Amy Wenzel, and it's called Dropping the Baby and Other Scary Thoughts in the Postpartum Period. And these two women have dedicated their careers to researching this and supporting women who are struggling with this. And it is specific because it's brought on by the birth of a baby. So it's very specific. And again, it is just like the little guy there in choose the thoughts that one thought gets in your head and it won't leave your head. And then it can often lead to being like, okay, I'm just not going to hold the baby anymore because I don't enjoy having those thoughts. Um, this is very different from hearing voices. So another, and one thing that I don't know if, uh, notice that there wasn't in the range of the perinatal mood disorder, the psychosis piece, one that is not something that we deal with at Families Matter. Um, in the sense that if there is fear around that, then that is something that they are, um, you know, um, go to the hospital right away and we can support them after that fact. But a lot of women there, one of their greatest fears is that these scary thoughts are going to mean a psychotic break for them and or that these scary thoughts are going to turn into action. And this is very different from hearing a voice outside telling you to do something, which I know this is kind of that idea um, that's represented in the cartoon. It's not, it's a, it is a, um, a thought that comes from within. And it is something that is so out of nature for you that that's why it surprises you and scares you and makes you so upset. And the majority of women that we work with um, are very upset with these thoughts. And um, it is something that does need to be talked about. And sometimes depending on how persistent and consistent these thoughts are, because with everybody it varies, um, professional um, supports would need to be brought in in the sense that there is specific therapy that can be done around these thoughts and or medication has been shown to reduce the severity and frequency of these thoughts. And again, this is something as a peer supporter that we would get them connected with in the community. Um, but it is something that we do talk about with a lot of the moms that we work with and the families that support them so that they can get the support that they need. Um, and um, it is something that we just see a lot and in honesty breaks my heart because of with these thoughts come the thought of I must be a horrible mother to be having these thoughts. And so just to be able to normalize the experience that they're not the only ones having this thought so that they can get the help that they need. Um, the next part is that depression piece that we saw on the range. And I'll kind of explain how it's fit in with postpartum rage. Um, so with the depression, obviously there's the hopeless, the helpless, so much guilt and shame, um, a negative mood, anxiety. How I like to describe how depression and anxiety go hand in hand with so many of the moms that we work with is if you saw the world through the lens of anxiety all the time, why wouldn't you be depressed? And so, cause it's a scary place and it's overwhelming and you don't know what to do with all of it. And so um, why I have these two together is part of with that depression and anxiety in the postpartum period comes with something that's called postpartum rage. And again, this is something that is not talked about a lot because of that shame that is associated with being a angry mom. Because um, there is the sense of lack of control. Um, it is just often described as I went from zero to a volcano over the silliest thing and I had no control over it and I don't know what to do about it. And there's even that anger towards the anger because they don't understand the anger. Like, why are they getting angry? And that's not how they see themselves as a mom. And that's not how moms are seen as these rage filled people. And so what we like to talk about in that anger piece is to, if you look at the top of the iceberg, what you see, so outbursts of anger, easily triggered, resentful, irritable, short fuse. Um, and that goes to speak to those relationship struggles and um, that lack of um, connection in the relationship that often comes with the birth of a baby. When you look underneath 
the iceberg of unmet needs, postpartum depression and anxiety, feeling alone, struggling to adjust to motherhood. So everything that we've been talking about, it can be a lot safer for a mom to express anger than it can be those vulnerable places of feeling alone, feeling inadequate, feeling like you don't deserve to be a mom, um, not understanding why you are struggling with what you're struggling with because you chose to have this baby, you knew what came with it. And so you feel like you don't maybe have that right to feel the way that you do. And so there's just a lot of underlying things in the iceberg that we do um, help the moms kind of work their way um, through. Um, and we just, you know, have these conversations again to see where it is a mom feels that she is struggling and anger is a huge part of it. Um, I would like to speak briefly, actually, to um, a dad I worked with once where he was the one who called in for supports. Uh, he was struggling in um, their son had been born and he was struggling with anger and he had been turned away from some programs because he wasn't a mom and the program was specific to supporting moms. Um, but also, too, he was getting frustrated with kind of saying, oh, you just need to take an anger management class. Um, and he felt that that was more. And so I got to work with this uh, gentleman and his family. And it was really amazing to me working. I did home visits with him. This is pre-COVID. And um, his wife and son were often a part of the visits as well. And it was everything that we just were talking about already so far, that increased anxiety, that lack of sleep, that lack of inadequacy as a parent, um, being terrified for his son. And so just to, it was just a wonderful example for me to show that it can truly show up in men just as it does in women and that the types of supports that you can get get there can be just as helpful for men as it can be for women, for a parent. And that pretty much sums up the range of the postpartum experience. Uh, perinatal mood disorder, again, a lot there, I realize. Um, what we'd also like to talk to, though, about are contributing factors. And this is what we can also see when we're supporting a family. And often we get a questions around, what can I do this to stop this from happening? Am I at risk? Is it my fault? I got this. I got this. Um, and will I get it again? And so one thing that I do want to talk about is there are definitely some contributing factors that can put somebody more at risk, but there is no checklist. There is no, you know, ways that you can, a checklist of, oh, I'm going to get it, or the, a checklist of these are all the things that I have to do not to get it. Um, in Supporting the families that I do, that I did over those um, seven years, I was in homes of single parents, um, intact families, um, families of multiple generations living in the house, first child, second child, third child, I think uh, fourth child, fifth child. Um, there were financial strains for some of them, no financial strains, relationship strains, no relationship strains. So it really is an equal opportunity um pain in the butt is the best way to put it and so why we look at these contributing factors though is so we can have a better understanding of what might be impacting you and what supports can best be put in there so first of all obviously there's a change in hormone levels for the mums like we were talking about and that's definitely that baby's blues but one thing i'd like to talk about with a change of hormones that a mom a lot of moms um don't know is if you are nursing, the change in um, nursing levels can really impact your hormones. And so if a baby goes through a growth spurt um, and is feeding more than they usually did, or if you are going back to work, so you're nursing less than you used to, that will change your hormone levels and that can change your um, emotional regulation abilities at that time. And then also too, when a woman starts to menstruate again, um, that emotional, if you struggled prior to having children when you um, got your period, 
I always kind of say it's like the universe kicking a mom when she's down because uh, it can get worse after a baby is born. And so then again, it's just understanding that, you know what, you might have a few days per month where it's a little bit more difficult um, because of that hormone level change. Another thing I'd like to highlight is the type A personality in the sense of, and it lays, uh, says down here earlier that perfectionism. So if a mom is a perfectionist and or what she likes to call a type A personality, that um, disparity between the way that their life used to be before baby and after baby is quite large. And that lack of control is very upsetting for them. And as anybody who has children knows, there is no control. There is no set schedule. You know, just when you think you figured things out, the baby goes and changes again. And so this can be something that can definitely contribute to that um, place in that postpartum period. Um, a difficult birthing experience. So a traumatic birth, we often see uh, a lot with um, the families that we work with. And that can be um, trauma, there's a couple different ways. It could be uh, just the birth itself in the sense that there was potential harm uh, that could have come to the baby or to the mother, uh, NICU stays, um, you know, any complications that came from that birthing experience. It can also be, uh, we've seen it with, um, past um, with moms who've had a history of sexual abuse, that even though the birthing experience by all measures was a normal birthing experience, but because of that past sexual abuse, it can be very triggering for them. And so this is just something again, that um, is an awareness to have in the sense that just like the scary thoughts, um, trauma, if it is something that is um, not dissipating over time from the traumatic event of the birth is something that, uh, again, getting connected to a specialist who specializes in that um, trauma-based therapy that can be very supportive to a mom. And again, um, going what it says, her story. So that again is unresolved or resolved, but a past history of trauma for a parent, having a baby can really bring things back again for them. So that's why even if it's been resolved and they've, you know, I've had moms say, well, I've been to therapy, I've got it all worked out, I thought. Again, having that baby and possibly reliving some things as you see your baby grow is something that can be very common and something that does need to be addressed uh, professionally with supports. That those sideway changes again, along with the hormone changes, a lot of the times we just, you know, suggest that the moms make sure that they get their thyroid blood work done when they are getting those postpartum checkups um, to make sure that that's not something that's impacting their mood. And um, the other part of it is a history of um, your own personal mental health struggle. That's a huge question. I've struggled with my mental health before in the past. Does that mean that I am going to get postpartum depression? Again, there's no guarantee one way or the other. It is definitely a, a contributing factor. And what we see a lot and what I've heard a lot is moms will be like, yeah, I've struggled with anxiety my whole life, but this postpartum anxiety is a whole new level and I don't even know how to begin to start, you know, to deal with it. Um, and so um, it's, you know, again, that place of, okay, well, let's figure out what's working. What can we can do to support you? And then there's also that contributing factor of a history of um, um, mental health struggles within the family, again, can be a, a contributing factor. And that can be, you can see that sometimes in the historical piece of, um, with my own lived experience with our son, I found out that that was something that occurred on my mom's side of the family and with my mom's aunts. And it was something that was never really talked about before I had my experience. And we were, my mom just happened to be talking to my grandma and my grandma's like, yeah, it happened with all my sisters. And so, you know, those types of conversations are important to have. Um, I probably would have liked to have known that maybe before I had my experience and didn't know what was happening. So these are all of these things by understanding contributing factors, by understanding the range. Again, it gives that person a place of where they can make decisions on what they want to do for themselves and um, how they can um, start to get the help that they need. 
So asking for help, building your village. So we've gone over the range. We've gone over what it can look like dependent on the person. We've gone over the potential contributing factors. Um, so once a person has identified that they need help, how can we support them? And I often use this phrase of, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. And the village looks very different now than it did when, when that saying was coined. And it is very personal to every person and uh, so much more complicated now during times of COVID of um, how we ask for help. And um, that is something that we work with the families in helping them get connected to other resources that are available. And these are all the different resources um, that we often talk about. This is one of my, the quote is a little bit, not the best, so I'll just read it for you. Um, what's the bravest thing you've ever said? Ask the boy, help, said his mother. And it's true, this is often something that can be very difficult for the families that we work with. Um, and so we look at those community supports of families and friends. And why I say be specific there is because a lot of people will say, how can I help? Just tell me, no, I can do anything. And usually they don't mean that. And usually it can be overwhelming for the person that you're saying, I'll do anything. How about, do you need a meal? Can I walk your dog for you? Can I support you with your older children? You know, um, can I bring you coffee? Right? So these are areas that families and friends can be so supportive. Obviously there's many nonprofits out there. I put local libraries in there because I have to say again, Hopefully when the libraries open, <laughs> libraries were one of my favorite places when I had little kids and where I met some of my best friends now and the programming there is amazing. But there's massage therapists, naturopaths, moms groups, parenting classes, doulas, midwives. Um, the EAP, we spend a lot of time talking about as well because I feel that it is an untapped resource. And so EAP is the employee assistance program that is offered through a lot of insurance um, companies that you have through work. A lot of them do carry over into maternity leave or you're able to use your partners. And those you can, um, so with the price, so EAP have their own therapists that you're not paying out of pocket, um, but you can also through insurance often um, get reimbursed for that private therapy piece. And so those are just something that um, we talk about with a lot with the families on different ways that they can get support. Another thing we talk about is that parental leave um, and you know, is it being used to its maximum? Um, is there a way that the partner can take some time off to be around you to support you? Um, so those are a lot of those community supports and then obviously Alberta Health Services, psychiatrists, psychologists, family doctors, public health nurses, um, social workers, lactation consultants and access mental health is a wonderful resource to for we at Families Matter will get a referral in for that uh, postpartum support because they called access mental health. Um, a, a lot of our referrals also come in from public health nurses. So the ones who are doing the immunizations of the wee ones, you know, they spend some time talking to mom and then they are able to either say to the mom, hey, here's the phone number, you can give them a call or they will refer directly to us. And in that peer support model that we have at Families Matter, we can work with a family who's got a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a therapist. Um, this is, it, it gives them that kind of holistic support um, so they are able to um, rely on the people who um, are in their field of um, experts. So that, these are the list of the resources that was mentioned earlier that I've been using. So obviously we have Families Matter up there um, and um, the Dropping the Baby and Other Scary Thoughts, as well as some of the other um, slides that I showed earlier that will be available for people who would like them. Um, and I would just like to take this time before we open it for questions um, about just families matter a little bit more. And I just like the pinata support group. So um, we do have 
the in the postpartum support that we provide for families women are able it's a free program women are able to um, refer themselves and are be referred to by other professionals and our agencies they go through an intake process during that intake process there are assessments that are done conversations that are had and then there is that option for the one-on-one -on -one support which we are now providing over phone or zoom um, and when we go back to being able to be in home, we will be able to go back to providing it in home, or they can join a postpartum support group. Um, and they are able to be referred or refer themselves for those postpartum supports anywhere up to baby is two years old. And the reason we do this is that's the other question we get a lot. And in that range of postpartum um, experience, there's always a question like, how long is it gonna last? Um, you know, and and why do we support families up to baby being two? And that's because we actually get a lot of moms who call in right around first birthday. And what we have found is that's kind of almost, a lot of them are going back to work and they look back on their year maternity leave and they had been pushing through their entire time and it looked nothing like they were thought it was going to. And there is this immense fear sometimes of returning to work and everything that that entails or an immense, loss of what they thought their postpartum period was going to look like versus what it actually did. Um, and so we get a lot of moms at that range. Um, and, you know, throughout that first year, it's very similar. They push through to a certain point until they can't push through anymore. And so that's why we support often up to that point. And so they can also then choose postpartum support groups. We have three of them currently running in Families Matter all over Zoom, and they happen year round once a week. And um, usually I would say the average of the mom stays in the group is around six months, but we've had moms who have stayed in it close to nine months to a year. So those are our postpartum supports. Another one really quickly is we also now have created a prenatal support group. So again, to encompass that whole perinatal mood disorder that it can happen during the pregnancy, we have moms who are coming to a prenatal group in the sense that it runs once a week as well, runs year round. And, you know, they um, learn some coping strategies and tools in preparation for their mental health when baby is born. Um, other things that Families Matters does is we have in-home um, supports with families zero to six. And so that is that FRN piece where those are families who are, who are wanting more of that parenting support. And again, in-home, um, in the sense of phone calls on Zoom now, going back to in-home. We also have parenting classes, a huge range. Um, we have a drop-in center, so like baby groups, drop-in and play. We are having some start up, I want to say in person soon, and we just keep them very, reg they're registered in low numbers. So we are able to do the distancing and um, follow all of those COVID guidelines. Um, we also do after schooling program where we have somebody who goes into two schools and does programming with the students. And then we have an SYP program, which is parents under 24. So that's successful young parenting program. And so we work with parents um, who are following that age range of 24 or under. And then we have very spe uh, specific dad programming as well um, for dads who are wanting support. And so again, in a nutshell, that is everything that Families Matters does. Um, if you were to go to the website, you would see quite the list of everything that's provided, but there's also the reception phone number and intake for any questions. Um, and when you do an intake with Families Matter, if we do not have services at Families Matter that can support you, then we get you connected to those services that can support you. And so we make sure that a family is connected when they are um, asking for help. And that is PPD 101 in a nutshell. Um, and if there are any questions, I would love to take them. Thank you.